Yeah, I guess we're ready to start our uh, city seminar now. Uh, Rashid, the floor, the screen is all yours. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Karam. On behalf of our co-conveners, I would like to welcome all our speakers and listeners to the final lecture of the city seminar in collaboration with the Department of Architecture and Department of Geography at the University of Cambridge. It is with great pleasure that we warmly welcome both Kenya Hara uh, from Japan and Asif Khan from London. Please allow me a few minutes to introduce our speakers uh, and set the context for this discussion. Harasan is a graphic designer, president of the Nippon Design Center and professor at Musashino Arts University. A highly influential, uh, his highly influential exhibition, Redesign Daily Products of the 21st Century toured worldwide, and he has built a reputation for producing exhibitions and educational programs that brings focus to new values by embracing keywords such as haptics, senseware, and exformation. Much of his work, including the programs for the opening and closing ceremonies of the Nagano Winter Olympic Games and promotion of Expo 2005 is deeply rooted in Japanese culture. In 2002, Harasan became Muji's art director. His wide ranging work is noted for its attention to transparency and, it, 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 and includes visual identity for Mitsuya, Matsuya Ginza, Mori Building, Tsutsaya Shoten, Ginza Six, and Mikimoto. He was chief creative director of the Japan House Project for, the, for Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In July 2019, he launched the High Resolution Tour website as a new approach to tourism, exploring specific locations in Japan from an individual perspective. Many of Hara's books have been published in English, including Designing Design, White, Designing Japan, and 100 Whites. I also would like to warmly introduce our second speaker, Asif Khan. Uh, who founded his architecture office in 2007 after graduating from the Bartlett UCL and Architectural Association. He works internationally on a wide range of projects from large cultural buildings and landscapes to experimental structures and is taught at the Royal College of Arts and Musashino Art University. His recent works include uh, the new museum in London, currently under construction, the blackest building on Earth, the Hyundai Pavilion at Pyeongchang Winter Olympics in 2018, and the vast carbon fiber entry portal for Dubai Expo 22, which I can vouch myself is beautiful. I can vouch myself, it's an incredible structure. Um, he was a finalist in the competition for the Helsinki Guggenheim Art Museum. In 2014, Asif was a recipient of the Khan Lion Grand Prix for innovation. He was awarded Architecture of the Year in 2018 by the German Design Council and received an MBE for services to architecture, architecture in 2017. Today's conversation will be partly in Japanese. Japanese English interpretation is available for this, which Kurosawa-san has kindly assisted. Thank you very much, Kurosawa-san. I also would like to thank Yoshino-san and Amy for their kind support throughout and arranging this upcoming talk. I'm very grateful to both of them. To this end, for those that have been following the city seminar, our overarching theme has been urban guilt, where Harasan will kindly begin by presenting and Asif, will, uh, Asif shall follow with a brief Q&A that will follow. So whenever you're ready, Harasan, please. Do yes. Please. Okay, can I share my, my visual? Oh. You can all see. Good. Yes. Okay. okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kenya Hara, a designer based on Tokyo. So, uh, thank you, Hulashit, for the nice introduction. So 
as you already explained, I am known uh, in the English people as an art director of Muji, the daily product maker. And uh, I, uh, I'm always designing the kind of the visual identification design for the, some special company or a brand. And sometimes I create a package design or an exhibition design or some special advertisement and sometimes create a book design. I think there is no border in the field of design. And I sometimes create some exhibition, so I'm known as a curator of some exhibition. Today, is, I'm focused on the theme, Urban Guild. At the first time, I misunderstood this theme, not Urban Guild, but the Urban Guild. It sounds a joke, but I have no idea about guild because it sounds me very European. But I recognize this team, Urban Guild, as the new collaboration in between the maker and the specialist and the creator. From that viewpoint, I explain some several of my works today. The first, I just focus on the one special exhibition I had created in these 10 years. The name of the exhibition is House Vision. House is a very interesting object for me in these 10 years. For me, house is not the architecture project. House is a very important crossing point of many industries. So to make a new in industrial vision visualize. So a uh, house will be a very important object. So house become the intersection of a variety of industries. So mobility, mobile industries, energy industry, a communication industry, or uh, healthcare industry or the medical industry, but circulating things, but to creating some uh, special communities. House can be the very important crossing point. That is why I focus on houses. Please think about the relationship in between the houses and energy. House is not the uh, things, not only to consume the energy, but also to circulating energy and creating energy. And the evolution of mobility will uh, giving us a very huge influences for the studies of housing, how do you think? And the house becomes a very uh, important object as an integrated smart appliances. For example, to think about the TV, the TV is evolving into a telecommunication device, changing its shape, and in some case, even becoming a part of the wall. And please think about the lighting appliances. Lighting equipment merge into ceiling and become an invisible part of the environment. And the housing literacy matures. In Japan, the people work and live in a great variety of way. 
and the house will change from being the status symbol to being the tool. And that is a perfect fit for their way of living. This viewpoint is very important. And the powerful market for house that can be a finishing touch to life plans. Aging doesn't mean, the, doesn't mean the loss of activity, I think. In Japan, the people in their 50s and 60s have the last disposable incomes. That is very important. This situation creates a very interesting market uh, for housing, I think. And house itself can be a very fantastic stage to realize uh, our own aesthetic. We can use our traditional aesthetic as uh, future resources. This is a very interesting point, I think. So the rule of house vision is to create a real scale model, real scale model of house in the exhibit site. The collaboration with a special company and the creator and realize a real scale model of house in the exhibition. That is a, a basic rule of this exhibition. This is a uh, view of the exhibit site, night view. And this is entrance of a house vision exhibition. Kengo Kuma, the architect, created this kind of the exhibit site in each exhibition. And this is an example of the exhibit house realized in house vision exhibition. Okay, let's start with the first example. The Toto, the very famous Japanese toiletry company, and YKKAP is a window frame maker. And Naruse and Ima Inokuma, Naruse and Inokuma is a young architect's unit. And Makoto Azma, the plant, plant creator, plant artist has collaborated together and create this kind of the very unique toiletry spaces. The YKK AP, the window frame maker, created in this case, the floor by using the translucent, transparent glass. And plant creator creating the circumstances. Today, we can live, we can't live without using this kind of special toilet so that even man is expected to do the routine work by sitting position these days because for the cleanliness. So the, how do you think? This team created this kind of the very special toiletry space as a collaboration. And the second one is a collaboration, collaboration with the Yamato Holdings, the transporting company, and Fumie Shibata, the famous product designer in Japan, had collaborated this one. House with refrigerator access from outside. Please imagine if the doors of the refrigerator could be opened from outside. This is a symbol mark of the transport company, Yamato Transporter. So I redesigned this symbol mark these days. I think the transport company can be a huge platform for the future service and industry, I think. The couriers are within 
five to 10 minutes is walking distance already. And a fingerprint authentication or the finger or face authentication system will do a great contribution for this situation or systems. fresh vegetables, laundry service, and many, many things. Like this, this is a looking from outside. This is looking from inside. If we can create this kind of door in front of the houses, the basic situation of sending and receiving things has Changed, changed impressively. And if we can get the life log, a huge life, life log through this system, the service for daily life will change, I think. This is a small change, but a very, create a very huge change. A worker, who lives alone has no time from receiving the delivery service. But by using this system, those people can easily to get the medicine from the hospital easily. If you use a remote, remote medical service, this system creates a very fantastic situation, I think. And if late delivery could be avoided, the delivery cost will be much improved, I think. This is not the architectural approach. Please think. But the house really is. This is a kind of the collaboration, is a, is a kind of the result of the urban guild, I think. And the visualize the possibility and make people awaken is most important role of design. I think the reason why I create this kind of exhibition. This is a wood grain house. That's a collaboration with me and the top palm printing company. This is a very funny one. Today, the surface of wood material can be realized well, owing to the progress of printing technology. The printing technology becomes more and more fantastic these days. If we scan this kind of the timber tips factory, we can realize a very fantastic architecture like this. It looks very funny. There is no real tree bigger as this, bigger as this. By using this technology, we can enjoy the variety of the scale of woods. The surface of woods realize in any scales. This small timber is the original one. And we scan it very, exact, uh, very clearly and uh, realize this kind of spaces. We are just inside the timber. How do you think? And how do you think about putting the high technology behind these new materials? Sensor and light appliance just behind this material. So this woody uh, circumstances can be a very interactive spaces by using this kind of technology. How do you think? So I create a uh, house vision three times. The first one is in Tokyo in 2013. The second exhibition in Tokyo in 2016. And the third exhibition is held in Beijing 
in 2018. And this model is from the House Vision Beijing. In this exhibition, high R, the electric appliance maker, and uh, Yang Ho Chan, the famous Chinese architect, collaborate together and created this kind of houses. This house is created by uh, constructed with a very light concrete material. And inside of the house, there is a natural garden. And the wall between the garden and the room is retractable. A port of drone is in the garden. And the high-tech appliance, uh, we call it the uh, wallification, refrigerator, air conditioner, washing machine, the cooking machine is in the wall or in the box. How do you think? The more the technology progressed, the more the distance between the artificial and nature become more close, I think. This is another idea. The sharing community of 400 boxes. The Fuari is a furniture maker. The Shuhei Aoyama is a Japanese architect based on Beijing. And they created this kind of the small houses, small boxes. The private space is designed as minimal as possible in this small box. This is type A, this is type B, and this type C. And combining together, inside the box is a private space and the outside, the other space is, is used as a common living space. Amazing, renovating the old building as a small town. So if I was a student, I'd like to live in that uh, very fantastic place. <laughs> I do think, very fantastic, I think. This is a real images of this space. And this is another idea, living garden. The energy is a solar generating uh, maker. The energy is creating the solar, solar panel, create, uh, making the solar panels. And mud architects is a very famous Chinese architect group. The Ma Yanson is a head of mud architecture, had collaborated together and created this kind of very interesting architecture. Generate electricity on its roof by using the power generating panels. This is the flat plan. This space is half open to the air. And this is a ceiling. This is CG, this is the real one. That each power generating panel is settled on light angle one by one. That each uh, power generating panel catches the sunlight in the ideal situation. This is uh, the view from the another angle. All the panels are transparent. So the inside the space is very light. How do you think? This space is open, but the inside of the space is cooling down by using the energy. But all the energy is created in its loop. How do you think? This is another model. Mass case. The Xiaomi, the 
famous uh, electric appliance maker, they're creating the smartphone, or uh, even today that they're just creating the electric cars. And the Xiaomi and the Li Fu, the Chinese architect, the middle aged Chinese architect, collaborate together and creating the, this kind of case of living for in mass. They can combine the electric appliance together and to create a closed loop flow of energy, water, air, and others. And they create this kind of the kits of uh, appliances. And the living space is inflatable. This is a side view. And this is a CZ. Connected to each other and created another spaces. And this is the view of base on Mars. A piece of this case is settled in the exhibit space. The black one is a exhibit space. The audience is just walking around these black spaces and see the center core, the small mass, small case. This is the exhibit space. This is a rear view of case. So the background is there is a bird's nest of the, the China Olympic Stadium. <laughs> the house vision is uh, uh, opened just in front of the big bird's, bird's, bird's nest. And this is a final example I, I'll show you today. This is a company house for Muji people. And Muji and Go Hasegawa, the young Japanese architect, collaborate together. So the Muji has a many branch and many shops in Shanghai, in, in China area. But for the young worker, young Muji people, uh, it is very difficult for the young people to get to get the, uh, enough living space in the urban place of China, especially in Shanghai. So the very, very narrow space, the living circumstances is very bad these days for the young people. They are just from, uh, coming from the country, countryside. So the Muji has decided to create a company housing for those young workers. This is one of the examples. Go Hasegawa create this kind of unique spaces. The upper space is used for the private bedroom and lower space is for common living space. Combining this kind of the unique spaces, the young people can use a very enough rich space for living. This is a very unique idea, I think. Looks strange, but very comfort, I think. Inside this, this tube, there is enough space for sleeping. And lower space is a very rich space for living. And like this, the light one is the bathroom. How do you think? Okay, I'm just concluding my present, my first presentation today. So I recognize the urban guild as a new collaboration in between the energy industry, transport company, material maker, high-tech appliance maker, printing company, daily product brand, researcher and specialist, and creator. So oh, I am just gathering 
this kind of the many kinds of the talented uh, people and the company and the combining together to create something something special for today's context so i think that this kind of approach is very important to create something how do you think Okay, thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you very much, Maro-san, for the very interesting presentation. Um, I'm sure we will have a lot of questions. Uh, thank you very much, Asif. Whenever you're ready, let us know. I was on mute. <laughs> okay, thank you, Haro-san. Um, okay, I'm going to pass the button to you. Thank you. And, you know, I've visited uh, House Vision twice in Tokyo and really mm. these um, these buildings, particularly that wooden one, they really come to life when you're when you're physically there and you interact with them. They're just just fantastic things you've never seen before. So uh, next time he puts one on, I recommend everyone to try to visit. Uh, OK, OK, I'm just going to share. OK, do you see my screen? Um, okay, um, so I'm going to speak about uh, two projects, and uh, they don't directly correspond to being guilds, but maybe they correspond to a new form of uh, what a guild might be, or the way that we create new ideas and information in the city. Um, so. Um, the first of these projects is a Museum of London, which Rashid mentioned that we've, we've been working on this project in the studio uh, for the last four years. Um, we are, um, for those who don't know, an architecture office and design office based in East London. We were established in 2007. And uh, now the projects kind of range from um, you know, urban design and master planning and landscape architecture to experimental architecture installations uh, and trying to explore always new territory in projects, um, letting the letting the design become a kind of vehicle for new ways of life, new ways of thinking, uh, sometimes new ways of using materials. Um, and I want to talk about the Museum of London first, uh, and then the Expo 2020 in Dubai. And we've been working on both these for the, both of these projects for the last four years. So they've been kind of interesting parallel journeys. Um, now, but I'll begin uh, in Ur. Ur is um, the old uh, capital of the Babylonian Empire, and the the, the empire was uh, at the time that Nabonidus was the, the, the emperor. And we're talking about uh, 500 BC. And Ur uh, was a you know, great empire, many ideas. It was built upon the kind of ruins of older empires and itself um, um, disappeared and became the kind of seeds for, for, for new ones beyond it. But I want to talk specifically about the first museum in the world. Um, I think a museum is a really important uh, typology um, and a really important kind of aspect of culture and we think of it conventionally as something modern and you know we think back well probably the vna is the first museum or you know uh, the first of that we can understand as a museum but actually in 500 bc there was a museum and this is thought to be the first museum in the world and the daughter of um, uh, nabonidus was uh, a um, princess called Enigaldi Nana. And it is thought that she assembled the world's first museum, more or less in this imagery, uh, in, in the picture that you see here, just outside um, the great ziggurat of her. Uh, and it was found, um, I think about 80, uh, 80 to 100 years ago by a British archaeologist. Um, uh, one of the most interesting things they found there, uh, which gave them a clue that this was a museum, uh, was was this object and there are a number of these found on site and this is a, a a clay cylindrical tablet with a cuneiform writing and they discovered that the writing was in three languages uh, including uh, neo-babylonian um, writing and the the uh, uh, realization when they decoded it was that this was a museum label 
So this was a description of an object in the museum. Uh, the kind of objects they found there were fragments of statues, uh, you know, small artifacts. But they, what was strange about this archaeological dig is that in one room, they found objects from a 2000 year of history, and they couldn't understand why these objects were stacked together in layers. Um, now, what's, what's really interesting uh, in, the, in the hypothesis, wh why were these things collected together? And it's thought that, um, as a, I mean, you could imagine this, as an empire, you want to be able to project a sense of where you've come from, uh, what your credentials are, uh, your, they might be kind of um, the divine right that you've inherited from, uh, from God or from a, uh, an ancient civilization. Uh, you might want to say, show your powers. So they might be things that you've, you've raided from other um, um, enemies. Um, and they might, you might want to suggest uh, um, empty spots, maybe, for future, future places that you're going to raid or discover. So uh, a museum, even from 500 BC, was about demonstrating your power and your prowess um, and also your credibility. Uh, your strength as a, as, a, as, a, as a nation, as a dynasty. And I don't think museums have really changed uh, for, for 2,500 years. More or less, the purpose of a museum has been to, to showcase your riches, to showcase the, uh, the things you took, uh, the give, you, give yourself credibility for the objects you've collected. I mean, Egyptology, Egyptian, uh, um, um, we can imagine like the Cleopatra's needle and all these kind of things were taken from from one place brought to another to, to, to build a sort of um, an artificial history uh, behind some someone that kind of gives this kind of feeling of strength and power. Um, but I think this is beginning to change uh, right now in museums. And this is this is a question that everyone goes into. What is the 21st century museum? And if if uh, if you ask any architect who's involved in, in, in museums, it's always the challenge which is set to them uh, by the uh, uh, so it's a live topic from the museum director and the live topic from the, the curators there. And I think it's something that a lot of people are struggling with, and, but also exploring. Um, now, we've been involved in the Museum of London. This is the original building. Uh, I think this, a city museum uh, has potential to become uh, something, something quite different. And I think it has potential, uh, this museum itself, um, according to Sharon Amant, the, the, uh, the fantastic director there, to become what she calls an urban think tank. So rather than just absorbing objects uh, into a collection from its history, they had this idea to position it more as an activist and a protagonist in the changing culture and evolution of, of uh, uh, the city of London. Now, uh, Museum of London has been collecting objects um, you know, for the 2000 uh, years plus of, of, of 2000 years plus of, of London's history, plus London's prehistory. So they have 7 million objects at the moment, and there's no way they could contain them in here. I think they contain about a quarter of these in this building. Uh, most of them are stored offsite. Um, but they were running out of space, essentially. So a, a few years ago, they, they decided to look for a new site. And the new site is the uh, was identified at Smithfield's uh, Meat market, which is in the Barbican, Smithfield Market is a is a um, is a, is a place where animals have been uh, slaughtered and sold uh, in the more or less just at the edge of the old city of London for the past thousand years. It's a place like steeped in history. It's a place that was outside of the original wall, so it didn't lose its kind of city plan. It's it's um, city plan. It didn't lose its uh, grid arrangement of streets. Um, because it didn't burn down uh, in the fire of London. So it's a very unique place. And it's a place where if you walk around there, you'll see uh, the headquarters of a number of the guilds, uh, you know, the cloth workers, the gold uh, goldsmiths, and so on, all located in this area, the leather workers and so on, the old guilds and livery companies, which are still active in different forms uh, today. So it's a place that has a lot of memories of, of, of old London. Uh, but what's also interesting about this location is it's, it's sort of in the center of a new London. Uh, and this is one of the early drawings we, we presented uh, in the competition. And it was kind of sat at the center of these different influences and uh, of, of, of kind of the creative East End, uh, um, 
uh, where, where we're located, of course, and uh, the tech city and startups of the old street, um, the remnants of London Wall, uh, you see there, um, the, the, the Thames where, where London's trade, uh, access to the world, the kind of cultural London of traditional cultural London, where all of the big museums are, Museum of uh, British Museum and, um, and so on, and uh, the v &A towards the West, and then power in Whitehall. So it's kind of this nexus of drawing all of these influences in from London, uh, from contemporary London and historical London is also uh, layered there as well. Um, so the site, the site is uh, fascinating. Um, in the museum building that will, the, the market building that will become the museum, uh, you've got this incredible large covered space, which was uh, a, a retail space for meat. You know, many, many traders together, clustering together in one building to sell uh, one product. And externally, what was interesting about this building, which was you know, built in 1890, designed by Horace Jones, who was the city architect at the time, who's, who's very famous for designing not only markets, but the Tower Bridge, which is like a super famous landmark of London. The outside of this building, was a series of retail spaces as well. So it's a square building, more or less, in plan. And there were 50, approximately, retail spaces around the edge. It's another uh, uh, shot from kind of early 1900s. You see in the background uh, Lockhart's cocoa rooms. Um, I have here a token from Lockhart's um, cocoa rooms, which you might see there, which says uh, it's good for, whoops. <laughs> Good for one penny's worth uh, of refreshment. There we go. So that's the original uh, uh, token which you would you would pay for your uh, cocoa in, and it was part of the um, uh, the movement at the time, which was um, kind of religiously led movement away from the temperance movement, away from um, uh, drinking alcohol and coffee. So it was part of a movement at that time to to um, to bring market workers um, away from addiction and so on. So it's kind of an interesting um, rehab clinic of the first type. <laughs> but yeah, this is this is uh, on our site as well. It's it's it's, it's really rich. Um, this is on the corner of what's now Farringdon Street and um, um, and Charterhouse Street. So there are uh, originally four market buildings, and the, t the three on the left are part of our project uh, that we're transforming. Yeah. So. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Now, I, I described the building as a you know, square in plan. So this is like an axonometric view of it, and a bird's eye view of it. What you can see is a ring of shops, which we call the outer crust, an interior, uh, uh, which has got structures for, for um, um, trade and so on in them. Um, these 50 shops are something, the thing that I'm going to be uh, talking to you about. Um, you could imagine any uh, um, reasonably thinking museum saying, well, 50 shops as our exterior is a fantastic opportunity to um, add to our um, income stream. Uh, museum funding is very challenging nowadays. If you could fill those 50 shops with, uh, you know, pret a manger and Bonugos and, uh, and uh, Costa Coffee and Starbucks, you're going to make a lot of money, and it's a great way to 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 um, to have an active frontage of some sort. But those content has nothing to do with uh, the museum. They have nothing to do with the future of London. You know, uh, it's just retail. So the idea that we had is, can you take those those outer um, those units, and can they become uh, protagonists in the story of the music in the story of the museum? So uh, what we suggested is. That those houses, uh, those shop fronts, incubate new forms of research and new forms of partnership. So, the proposal uh, that we brought to the museum is to to turn those fifty uh, shop units into twelve houses. Uh, this is an, an idea of what those houses could contain. It, uh, but essentially, a scheme where and this is a, a kind of plan zoom in of those things. The houses could. Uh, contain any mixture of organizations. It could be, um, there could be retail, there could be craft, there could be research, there could be societies, 
uh, um, uh, the Martin Center could be there, <laughs> New London Architecture. There could be futurologists mixed with archaeologists. Um, and the, the, the idea of that is that the museum um, has a, uh, a constant uh, renewal of ideas occurring in it. So rather than um, collecting uh, objects about the past, it is a place where which incubates ideas about the present and the future. And so you could imagine if Google had a uh, uh, Google Street Labs, for example, had a, a room here next to Roman archaeologists, there would be some uh, coalescing and kind of sharing of information and, and maybe a transport uh, um, consultant. And the three of them create a kind of new idea of uh, how people can move around the city. So. Uh, this, of course, could be uh, one year just a collection of all leather workers, right? You know, you could imagine uh, another time, another year with, under a different director, they might empty them all and they might be um, low rent spaces for kind of community activities. So the idea of, of this place is a extre extremely or infinitely flexible um, string of um, exhibition activation spaces around the edge of the museum. And I don't think uh, there's any museum in the world that has um, an exterior which really engages with the city beyond the way it looks. And try and think of one that, that puts its content on the outside, that puts its public engagement on the outside, that leaves its... Uh, that leads its facade, uh, leaves its uh, elevations uh, open to change over the years. Um, most museums uh, freeze themselves. And this one is one which takes a market typology, the marketplace, and it makes it from marketplace of, of retail uh, to an art marketplace of uh, ideas. Okay, so what's quite enjoyable about this as architects, okay, we're dealing with an existing building, but rather than transform the existing building ourselves through some strong architectural, uh, architectural intervention, what we're doing is we're equipping the building to be able to change infinitely in the future. Uh, and the idea that future architects will come in and plug into these uh, elevations and create their own architecture, which might last for six months, one year, 10 years, but be replaced and again and again, is a way of um, the building and the museum staying contemporary uh, uh, forever. I mean, the cocoa rooms were making some uh, adjustments to the glazing, but the interior is, uh, is going to be, which is a discovered interior, is going to be completely uh, restored. Um, the external facade is um, is being restored. We're working with Julian Harrop architects, who are the conservation architects, who worked on Noyce Museum. We're working with Stanton William architects, uh, who are our collaborators. And we're all working on different parts of the museum. Julian Harrop works on the entirety. Um, the external facade, we were adding this uh, signage system, which is, uh, again, completely flexible, but it's based on the lettering, uh, architectural lettering that you used to see in, 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 in London in the Victorian era. And this is, this is a canvas then, a 200 meter long canvas for words, uh, for artist commissions, for, um, uh, for the museum to take the voice of a community or an individual, a child's voice, uh, whatever they want to say, they can speak to the city and the city can speak to them. So, uh, and it will be a 24 hour uh, museum as well as this kind of this image is, uh, is, um, is showing. So um, this is uh, an idea of um, a museum as a, as a place where ideas um, uh, can be showcased and explored and it can contribute to the, to the future of the city. Um, now, the second thing I want to talk about, and this will be quite uh, quick, is the expo, and you'll know the sectional drawing of the um, Crystal Palace, which was the, let's say the, the, show, the showcasing architecture for the first great exhibition in 1851 in London. This was the, uh, the garden designer or architect, um, but he was more of a garden designer, um, and um, J Joseph Paxton, and that was his sketch on a napkin that created the world's first uh, well, the largest building in the world, uh, a million square foot in, um, uh, in 1851. It was built in, in, in less than a year, the largest cover space in the world. I mean, still very few buildings equal this size. It was so big 
uh, that the elm trees in, in Hyde Park were internalized. And he was a garden designer first. So what was very interesting is the whole idea we have today of nature inside and outside uh, blending was, was really first invented here. And the second thing that was invented here, if you think about any glass and steel building you see today in any city, it owes Joseph Paxton for inventing it. This was uh, garden conservatories turned into, into buildings. Um, and the, the kind of requisites of expos uh, are the requisite of an expo is just sort of well, the opportunity. I think it's similar to house vision. And these are places where over the past 150 years, architects from around the world, different nations, have not only showcased their, their trade and their um, uh, ingenuity, uh, but they've also showcased and their prowess, they've also showcased new forms of, of, in, of, of architecture. Um, so Dubai Expo is where we've been designing the public realm uh, for the last four years. And the building behind, you see in the background is by, by, by Grimshaw. Um, but I want to just show you one structure from this, uh, which is in the, in the background here, which is these, these portals, which um, Rashid mentioned. These are uh, carbon fiber structures um, that are the entrance gateways to Expo. Now, when you, when you create an Expo, um, of course, I think there's a similarity between that first museum I mentioned and all, all museums concurrently, which is about kind of showing your, showing who you are, demonstrating who you are, but also showing where um, the, op the point about Expo is about showing the future and showing where you're going. And the Expo in Dubai was a, was a first Expo in the Manasa region, that's Middle East, North Africa, um, South Asia region ever in 150 years. So it's a very important moment where that region has been recognized as something that, it, that should say something. So our um, approach to designing the six kilometer public realm has been let's let the region speak and let's, let's tell stories about the place and let's lead the narrative. So it shouldn't be a kind of Western oriented narrative. It should be a Middle Eastern oriented narrative. So how, to, how to, people can enter this place, we felt should be through a gateway because it follows a typology of, 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 of uh, uh, Middle Eastern uh, forts and um, 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 large houses where you enter a gateway into a courtyard. Uh, when you see that, you see that this is a, a gateway into the courtyard. Um, and the structure is a, a mashrabiya, which is, uh, you know, a fundamental shading typology of the region. But the mashrabiya is made um, using, um, this is a model of it, um, using a woven uh, carbon fiber. And so the idea of uh, this, this structure is that it, using the minimal amount of material possible to create the, the lightest structure, to span the greatest distance, to create the maximum amount of shading. So it, 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 it balances itself between material usage and uh, um, shade provided and maximum span. So it's a sort of algebra, uh, algebraic equation between these three uh, quantities. And the, I'm just going to share some, 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 some Instagram images from this. The idea of this project, this, these aren't my photographs, these are just, just people the last few days um, uh, putting these pictures on Instagram. The idea of doing a project like this, we are sharing a new craft, um, sharing a uh, trying to spread some seeds of a new aesthetic uh, or, f or future aesthetic uh, for, for, for the region, which is based on its past, but also it's a manifesto piece for, for the expo itself and what people should encounter being like setting, um, setting a new language for that, uh, for that place, a new uh, a stepping stone in some way uh, to the future. Okay, so this is this is the courtyard that I mentioned that you that you that you move from between uh, two. So you know, um, Expo is a new piece of city. This is the, this is the the, um, the paving we've done six kilometers of paving, all interwoven, uh, and uh, kind of following this idea about moving at different speeds and a new kind of public realm which suits kind of resting, running, uh, um, uh, relaxing, walking, and so on. Um, um, 
but th this idea that the expo is a, is a new piece of city uh, is concurrent um, for, for ideas to be explored and new new possibilities to be to be mapped is concurrent with the idea for the Museum of London that we have created a new piece of city with an open format for the future to be explored. Um, so I think uh, maybe there's a similarity here with um, with the House Vision project in the, in, in the which I think is a counterpoint. Um, where we create an open canvas uh, for things for things to happen, an expo is that in its in its kind of essence. But the Museum of London is a new exploration of that of that theme. And who knows uh, what kind of place it will be in the future? Who knows what kind of guilds and uh, um, collective ideas will emerge from it? Uh, it's a place for for intersection uh, between architecture and uh, community, uh, technology, and uh, and um, and craft. So I think I'll finish there. Um, thank you. Uh, I'll hand back to you, Rashid. Thank you, Asif. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. And I can also say firsthand, I've visited the expo site, which is open. There's a pre-opening uh, and there's a lot of people already visiting. And I think the structure, the gated Mashrabiya, is a question. Um, uh, there, so let us get this, let, let us get directly into some of the questions. Uh, Kurosawa-san, there were a few questions that were shared specifically to Harasan. Perhaps you can translate and then respond to them. Can you see them? So you're on mute, yes. Um, sorry, could you send them to me again? Because I needed to log back in and oh. I haven't um i don't see anything in my inbox so if you could I'll maybe send them share. your way yeah yes thank you thank you in the meantime perhaps us if you can uh just briefly i know that i've heard it from you the the whole journey of building the the gates for the expo site and i know that you worked with a small engineering and manufacturing firm in germany and perhaps maybe you can talk a little bit about this whole relationship of a family business at such yeah, a lot. Yeah. So in um, there's a sort of region of uh, Germany that I'm sure a lot of you will know in, in South Germany and Bavaria, where there are enormous number of very specific uh, um, industries, uh, you know, which received a, a great deal of funding uh, to, to survive and exist post-war there was this investment in those and you get these collections in in really in the countryside of remarkable um craftsmanship or high technology or something so we we were working we worked and i mean i think i found this company uh, uh in 2011 it, then it was called cgb um and it's a carbon fiber company I had this idea back then to make a project in, in Miami, which was a carbon fiber structure, a very large one. And this was the only company in the world that had a machine that could make it really in the middle of a village uh, called Wallerstein. Uh, um, uh, and uh, next door, uh, they have another carbon fiber maker, which is a, a friend, but competitor. Uh, you know, within half an hour, they're the carbon fiber companies that make the BMW i3 and i8. Uh, which were purchased by BMW, um, but they were independent businesses. Um, so there's, a, there's an enormous deal of uh, innovation happening there. Um, and and really, what's interesting about that company, it was in, it was made by a a doctor called Bernd Schottdorf, who's now he's a doctor artist, um, you know, real Renaissance man. He invented uh, a blood typing machine uh, in um, in um, 30 years ago, became very rich and uh, explored just he's a basically an inventor as well as being a doctor and an artist. So one of his inventions was this carbon fiber machine, as well as a blood typing machine all, all sorts of stuff. So, you know, I went there, I met with him, uh, we discussed, found our kind of um, common ground. And, and the, we, the woven structure was something they'd never um, done before. They never thought of transferring this into architecture in a modular form or something like that. And Expo, um, we started working at Expo, really I just took a, a mashrabiya and I folded it and I said, this should be the entrance, just this folded origami thing. 
and uh, and but I know I said I know it needs to be carbon fiber to make it and and really uh, this what fe feels like a cottage industry um, was were the people that were able to make this happen you know working with them we worked with a, a engineer who works on airplanes normally designing lightweight carbon fiber airplanes uh, and and it's uh, so there's something about um, uh, actually passion uh, you know and, and, and breaking rules uh, to enable design to happen like that sometimes and risk taking and this is something that Expo uh, uh, sponsored that uh, you know that potential to happen you know they, they took the great step to be the clients and to kind of to um, to enable these relationships and to enable all the researchers and scientists to get together around us um, and uh, and build it um, I, I, I always find this whole uh, relationship interesting that a small manufacturer in Germany that's able to collaborate with an architect and this kind of manufactured artisanship growing in Spiral. Um, before I jump into Kurosawa san, maybe she's already translated it. Maybe you, Fei Peili, Karam, do you have any questions? Um. No, um, can I can I just translate the question to Harasan, please, if that's uh, okay. Yeah, ano Harasan, eto Alex san toyu ano seto san kara no koshimon nan desu kere domo ano ari arigatou gozaimashita subarashi prezen o ano itadakimashite ということ nan desu kere domo ano sono naka de desu ne ano Harasan wa sono collaboration samazama na sangyo no collaboration kan no taisessa o ano toite irashaimashita kere domo tada genzai no kyouki kikan ni oite. それぞれの産業は本当に別というふうにあの捉えられていると思うんですけれども、例えば建築の生徒としては、あの本当に働き出すまで全く他のデザイナーの人と関わることもなく産後科の産業のことをきちんと構築することもなくっていうことなんですけれどもこれはどのように捉えられていらっしゃいますでしょうか特に原さんがさまざまな業界でデザインをされているのであのどういうふうにですねその教育を変えていくことが重要だと思われますかあのミュートになっていらっしゃいます。Yeah, thank you very much for the important question. So the as I I was graduated the department division named the Department of Science of Design, and I am the so teacher of the same department today. In this department. Well, there is no border in between the design field. So the, I'm just uh, thinking about the 3D product design and the visual design and the photography and the movie and the architecture together. Um, and I think the, um, the circulation of many, many kinds, many aspects of a viewpoint is very more most important things of designing things uh, to not to create a specialist but to create a, a talent like a ip uh, cell it cell ip cell right? that can be a uh, everything the circumstances and the uh, context of design will be changing rapidly so the uh you you should be the talent like a ip cell right? you can be at everything and at, at, you can attach every every situation that viewpoint is very important i think now if the education of designing is become too much special we should improve that situation i think and uh, the every student should break through this problem i think how do you think how do you think, Ash? So the, hmm. today's situation, the many uh, possibilities there uh, to collaborate many talented people uh, in the, uh, ma, ano, real design field. So I always collaborating with architects, with a, a special material maker and a, a special product designer. So the collaborating and the collaborating, collaborating is very important, I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
、そうだ。In the, in the real、uh, department, the department is divided to much、uh, smaller, I think, the visual communication design, product design, space design,、uh, interactive design, architectural design. So, divided so, so small. That is a very、uh, terrible problem, I think, to combine it together. So, only one department or Design and architecture or, or creation. So that's very important. After learning the many aspects of design, you should select your specialty by yourself. That's very important, I think. Uh, I, I find, I mean, you, The idea of collaboration is,、uh, is, I think, also fundamental to, 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 to the way that I work. Um, actually, one of the problems of specialization is, is that、uh, very few new ideas are created.、Uh, there's, a, there's a tendency to relax into、um, uh, a cycle, like a commercial cycle for an, for an office of any sort. And the commercial cycle relies on repetitive work because you can、um, make money by. Doing the same thing again and again. And、oh. this, is, this is the majority of companies、uh, repeat their old projects in slightly small ways. I mean, any kind of design company, unfortunately, this is a, the, the reality of low risk. And、oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and when you, the, when there's kind of two approaches one is to radically change your approach each time. Which is fantastic for ideas, but it's extremely high risk.、Uh, and it means that there's always like a two year, three year process to learn new things、um, and to build the competency and build your team. But if you collaborate, you can find those competencies in another team. And maybe you reduce the research and development time by two years, three years. So you can, you can if you want to explore, Like we did、uh, lightweight um, um, construction technologies for, for, for spanning, as we did, and paperiness of architecture,、um, which, by the way, is a very old idea. It's from、uh, Expo 1970.、Uh, uh, if you look at it, Kenzo Tange's master plan had the huge space frame as a, as a central structure. If you go back further, if you look at uh, uh, the、um, Uh, the work in、uh, the All Russia Expo in 1896, I think you, you get similar structures um, um, that were.、Uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of maybe show some images afterwards. But so the idea of kind of spanning and so on is, 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 is old. It's old, but very fascinating for, for, for architects.、Um, so by, by working with these,、um, with these collaborators, we reduce risk but we and we enable faster explorations to happen. Uh, I think that the, the, the,、um, the, the guilds uh, were, uh, they were, of course, unions um, of, of um, methods, shared methods, which might be also kept secret sometimes,、uh, but methods as a, as a way of controlling prices,、um, as a way of kind of controlling access to trade, to craft, and access to practitioners.、Um, and、uh, I think they are,、um, they are the opposite traditionally of innovation, and they are against change and risk. And I think what we've been talking about, and you know, the projects that we tried to do, the pro clearly the, the project that uh, uh, Harasan has been doing at、uh, House Vision, is,、um, is, is, is about a new form of,、um, of collaborative, a new form of work, which is the, the opposite of, of the traditional guild. But, it, but in the end,、um, what, uh, the, the, the organizations maybe are, are unified by their differences. They're unified by the, by the approach they take to, to, to risk and,、uh, and change. Yeah. We, I, I wish there were more, more organizations exploring this, these things. We sometimes feel like we're on our own. <laughs> so, so, 
Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Arasan, for the answers. Okay. Well, no, today I I sh I, sh I'm sh I had to show you the very special aspect of my uh, designing, you know, very exploring aspect of designing today. Not only the exploring one, but also the basic, very uh, serious uh, field is there. So today in Japan, the economy is just shrinking because the population is just shrinking. We have a many problem in the society, but the uh, ability to find out the real problem or real possibility is very important uh, talent uh, owing uh, uh, for the, for the design, designing designer. Designer should have the uh, power or talent to find out the essential problem just from the real society mm. and uh, find out the possibility, find out the problem and create a project. That's a very important aspect, not only to using the fantastic material and fantastic uh, energy solar panel, no. So that is one aspect. The another aspect is to find out the very serious and very important and very essential uh, problem just behind the society. That's a very important point, I think. So in that, in that situation, we should have another urban guild to solve, to make a solution about this situation. I think, I think, uh, Harasan, one of the, and I, sorry, I, I should open to the questions. I, I just, uh, some point which is very interesting is the, how you train uh, young people or any person to have this um, awareness of um, problem solving. Because it's actually, I think the prob one of the challenges we have is the form of the education system from primary education onwards. So even from primary, they are, you're beginning to be specialized into, uh, you know, very standard training, which is not problem solving training. It's, mm. um, it's kind of, it's actually like a Victorian system in, in the UK, at least, where you're learning uh, standard methods for solving problems. You're given a problem, you know how to solve it already. And then you just do the process and they give the answer. There's no um, expectation of invention, expectation of, uh, of seeking your own solutions or understanding conceptually things differently. Um, so it's meant to equip you for standard types of work, you know, in a, in a workplace. But now the world has changed enormously and it's changing in a speed where we can't even track what's happening, particularly t with, with technology uh, uh, changes and climate change. So my, my, my kind of uh, um, sort of struggle is how we create an education system which is matching to the problems that we have ahead of the human race. Like, how can we create polymaths? Because I, I think it's what you're talking about, like non-specialization is very broad creative thinkers who have multiple talents who can draw information from many different directions and use those together to make new things uh, which are solutions to, to, to con contemporary problems so I, th I think that i think the solutions have to start uh, not just as professional designers but really in how our children uh, are taught and what kind of teachers they have access to and how they learn to collaborate from that early age. Uh, so I want to design a school, actually. This is something, something that, not the school building. Actually, you can make a nice school, but easily. I think a curriculum is a very interesting thing to design. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, not only to solving the problem, but also to find out uh, very a uh, unique problem is very important. Uh, that, so uh, we count number 9, 10, 11, 12. Right? After 12, most of the people looking for the 13 is the next, the 13 is the next. But we, if you find out the decimal point, right? the decimal point creates a number of the number in between the 9 to 10. Right? If we can recognize the concept of the decimal point, 
so much number in between the nine and ten. So that that creates a very fantastic uh, viewpoint of designing. That is very important. The specialists always thinking about the 13, next 14, or 50 top. No, another viewpoint is very important, I think. So uh, if we can find out a very unique problem, right, so the solution will be found easy. Mm. Many people can find the solution easily. If we can yeah, so make a presentation, this problem is, is very fantastic. This problem is very important to be solved. Please think about the solution. The many people is, can uh, attach this uh, fantastic problem together. You know? yeah. And not only the uh, special talent to create a solution, make the fantastic problem is more important, I think. Yeah. I think yeah. the challenge is that pe creatives, like we are creative professionals, yes. we, we were trying to protect creativity as though it's his only professionals who can be creative like you have to have have this certificate but actually yeah. creativity should be is everyone's right and it's everyone's ability and the uh, people in school who are told oh you must choose art or science or you must choose uh, uh, you can study design and technology or you can study geography and this is my daughter's having this question now um, yes. so you choose a path but actually uh, I agree with you fully. It's a, it's a, it's a lifelong, it's a need actually for society to share creativity and uh, to ensure everyone feels the right to participate in problem solving. Yes. And these days I'm very interested in the uh, tourism industry, mm. not only to find out uh, material. Right? So the tourism industry is very important these days, I think. So especially in the Japanese context, so the, I studied a special project named High Resolution Tour. Please check the Google High Resolution Tour. You can see the something. Uh, I created a very special website by myself. I travel alone and take up to, to visit the very special deep place of Japan and uh, take a movie by myself and edit it by myself and take took a photo by myself under lighting and uh, uh, to introduce a very deep special place of Japan. I already visit the 34 place in these two years, every month. So that's a very great uh, education for me. Eh? I'm just learning Japan, Japanese local places and I can find, find out the real, uh, real value from that viewpoint. That is the best. That that is my basic research. Is the basic research is very important for me. Not only research for the new material, not only research to create a new technology, but also the landscape or circumstances, the old technology, the food, and the culture is very important. If we can use this kind of the old uh aesthetic as a futuristic resources we can create a very fantastic uh, design in the future so that is important for me today i introduce you the very yeah, so no, too much exaggerated <laughs> examples but that is important i think but another another aspect uh, please find out the treasure in your foot point so that is a uh, very uh, important these days for me mm. the world is becoming global and more global even in the COVID-19 context I think the global situation is not changing I think the people the new nomad age is just coming I think people moved moves always the moving is very important i think just after the covid 19 people started to move again the new uh, nomadic era is just coming in that situation the locality is very important the global and the local is not the opposite uh, meaning 
global, combining the global and local, create a new value, I think. So in that situation, the knowing about your own culture, uh, your own landscape, your own land is very important to the global context, I think. This kind of view is very important. So if you get this kind of viewpoint, you can collaborate with the many uh, talented people. Now, if he is a very old man, old craftsman, you can collaborate with him. By using the old man's craftsmanship, we can create a very fantastic uh, values towards a global context, I think. How do you think? So if we can get the next chance, I just, I just introduced a, a new local value né? by using this kind of the local uh, treasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The house vision is uh, my, uh, of course, a recent project, but it is uh, started about, about 10 years ago. But today I face on the another aspect of uh, creativity these days. Of course, the house vision is continued even today, but the house vision is a basic research too. The uh, creator uh, is just uh, doing the basic researches by yourself. That is very important. This is a breakthrough point to create the border of the uh, design field or architectural field. Mm. So, do you understand my poor English? <laughs> Enjoy it very much, Harasan. Okay. Mm. Uh, perhaps I, I uh, thank you very much again for for the for these comments and, and an engaging conversation. I'd like to just quickly focus on a few questions and comments uh, towards you, Asa. Uh, the head of the department, James Campbell. Uh, posed a couple of questions where he says carbon fiber isn't normally used in building because it, it's great advantages, lightweight and high strength, and not usually seen as a huge advantage. Weight in many buildings is an advantage to stop the building from blowing away. Is the gate a building or a piece of sculpture? And then there was one comment about the environment, which is carbon fiber isn't very environmentally friendly, could it have been bamboo? I'm fascinated about your choice of material. I would like to see also here Kenya, Kenya's choice of material. So that's one question. Uh, the other one, uh, a follow-up question is, guilds implies training through apprenticeship, uh, through apprenticeship, through working. Should we be training designers in schools or in the office or a combination of both? Uh, so those are two very broad questions. Maybe Kurosawa-san, you could translate these two comments. あの、役しますか。あの、はい、一人ですね。一つ目の質問なんですけれども、あの、先ほどのアシフのプレゼンの中にあったカーボンファイバーを使ったゲートがありましたよね。あれカーボンファイバー普通は建物には使われない。な
Like it's a it's an architecture that was delivered on the back of a few trucks, and it weighs very very little, um, and it's a region which is built upon uh, built by nomadic peoples. There's a whole narrative there about bringing your architecture and constructing it very quickly and then moving it somewhere else uh, when, when the situation is different or more favorable. So that's part of the kind of uh, regional context for the discussion. And maybe it kind of plugs into Harasan's point about, and I, I really do believe it, that the architect of the future is going to need to be nomadic. Uh, if you take, I mean, the last exhibition we did, a uh, UK pavilion, sorry, uh, Koros Harasan is a long, uh, <laughs> a long translation for you. But the exhibition at the UK Pavilion in um, Astana Expo in Kazakhstan that we that we did, I used the Kazakh yurt as the example of um, the most sophisticated piece of architecture um, on the planet, being that it's a um, lightweight, modular, um, movable. You can put you can wrap it in cloth to make it warm. You can you can take the cloth off to make it cool. Uh, it can be handed from generation to generation. It's 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 so sophisticated, and it has a very, very deep relationship with, with nature. Uh, it comes from nature, and when nature changes, you move it to suit the nature. So it is it, that that's where this that's where this comes from. Um, and exploring materials and different ways of achieving that, I mean, is is I think our is our responsibility. Um, could you make it from bamboo? Uh, you couldn't achieve those spans with with bamboo. They actually they use carbon fiber at the moment in re, as re, concrete reinforcement. Um, that's a very interesting new field that's that's emerging. But the concrete, of course, is, has very high embodied energy and and, and so on. So, uh, but yeah, we're we're we're, we're um, the main talk, talking point really is about modularity and, and nomadic architecture um, and and education, of course. Like it's an idea of like a a uh, an educational collaborative um opportunity um to to kind of talk about visual um visual language and engineering it's, uh, it's uh, i think the to talk about the material so uh, i select the i select the artificial material artificial fiber i like the natural fiber the cotton and the kenaf the paper, I like this kind of natural material, wood and the silk. But I like the artificial fiber too. So the the I understand the people who hate to pronounce the polyester. The polyester, I hate polyester, right? but uh, I understand. But the artificial, artificial fiber the resource of the artificial fiber is natural, I think. Not, not like the artificial material, I think. Uh, the more the technology progress, the more the difference in between the nature and the artificial is more close, I think. The, te the technology is going ahead the more the technology is more sophisticated, the, the difference in between the artificial and nature is becoming more closer, I think. This viewpoint is very important, I think. Don't hate the artificial things. The artificial is a kind of the nature, I think. The pre-thinking, uh, the usage and the treatment of, the, of any materials and uh, to getting the professional uh, skills. So the, I have not so much skill for about taking a photo. I always asking the very talented photographer and movie cameraman. But in special case, in the high resolution tour, I took a movie by myself by using the smartphone. So, and in case by case, so that uh, if I, I I became the uh, sixty two years old, but I'm just starting to learning to take a movie by myself. That's very fantastic for me. And but in another case, 
I should ask the very special professional photographer to uh, uh, to furnish my idea. So that's a case by case. But the combination of the well skilled people is fantastic, I think. The designer sometimes should be the uh, creative director to combine and select the skill and talents, ne? Uh, including the uh, progressed architects and the old craftsmen, the combi combining it together. That's a very important viewpoint. The only, the, the only things that one people can do is very small, but if we can make a collaboration together, we can do a very fantastic achievement. Actually, I, um, how is that? I think it's, it's, I'm going to do something a little bit uh, um, opportunity because, because this is by a Zoom call. I uh -huh. can show you, our, this is our office. I mean, everyone, this is an oh, office without many people in it at the moment. Oh, exciting. But we, <laughs> oh, this is a nice new project. Oh. Well, you know, it's a library. But I wanted to show you this space to everyone because oh. half of our office is a traditional office you could say. And a half of our office is a, a making space. So this is, this is actually the other half of our office. So it's a collaboration. Uh, it's a place where we collaborate between like craftsmen and uh, also the music is on here, but <laughs> they're building some experimental thing now. Like this is a, um, oops, sorry, just one this is, um, part of the Museum of London, the staircase that we're, we're building at the moment. I'll leave here because it's very noisy. <laughs> but, and this is our CNC workshop, so this is also another workshop. But the idea of a, maybe a new form of practice, which is built out of specialists from different fields, we have, I think, uh, um, some very interesting possibilities. And those become permanent memberships of the studio. It's not just an architecture office. Uh, I think that kind of, I think a lot of people are maybe exploring this possibility now. It's not, not just us. Um, and uh, we don't know what the result will be, whether it's going to make a, a, something new or maybe something traditional. We don't know, actually. But uh, this is quite exciting um, to, to explore how we practice, to deconstruct it and to, to rebuild it in new ways. Thank you very much. Exciting. Thank you. Um, I think we have now crossed over the one hour and a half mark, and we're all enjoying our conversation very much. And I'm oh. sure if we keep going, we can continue going. But perhaps some closing remarks, Harasan and Asif. Any closing remarks about uh, the talk? We have, I can say on behalf of our co conveners, we have really enjoyed the conversation, and I'm sure a lot of our visitors as well. Thank you very much, Rashid. I enjoyed this uh, conversation very much. So, uh, so I expecting the, the, there is another chance to make a presentation or another aspect of uh, designing. So, thank you very much. Hopefully, Harasan, there would be an occasion where perhaps we can invite you to Cambridge to a high table dinner or an in inter department. <laughs> I see my co conveners nodding their heads as well. Yeah. And maybe ask if any final comments or remarks. Well, no, uh, thank you for the discussion. And Harasan, always very good to see you and very good to see you, Rashid. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I, I just uh, the, thank you for everyone for listening. And I think this idea of um, that you could go back and think about what education should look like for children. You know, how could we educate the next generation? What could a curriculum look like? And, you know, have a think about that. Maybe there's a new way of doing things that could be better suited to the challenges we're going to face in the future. Yeah. We don't have the solutions, but the next generation will be part of making them. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm very honored. It's a very honor to, to have a chance to make a net uh, presentation in such a fantastic place. And Klaus Aosan, thank you very much for the nice translation. I'm very safe in eh, your existence. <laughs> Sorry, my poor English, everyone. Thank you. Again, thank you. Just, just to conclude, thank you very much, Kurosawa san, Yoshino san, as well as Amy. Thank you very much for your support. And, th and I think, on behalf of our co conveners, we thank you again finally. And then 
we can conclude. So Karam, whenever you would like to switch it off, we're happy to yeah. be. Uh, yeah, so we'll be ending the meeting now. Thank you all for attending and the recordings will be available in two weeks time uh, for the entire city seminar for you to watch later. And uh, yeah, thank you all, Kinihara, Asif Khan and everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Our great translator as well. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.